started, sing loud. Really, sing loud.
quake before moved by the sound of his voice and the seas that are shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken for my regard and through it all through it all my eyes are on for me to not believe even when my eyes can't see and this mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea through it all through it all my eyes are
with me. Father, we just come before you today. God, I'm, I'm going to claim for this group that, that we meant the words we just sang. They're prayers from our heart to yours. Put to a melody, but God, sometimes it requires a song for me to even know how to express my deepest feelings. So God, that, that we could go around and we could talk about all of the stuff we've faced just in the past six, nine, twelve months and probably be here all day, but through it all, God, our prayer is that our eyes are on you. We know that you're on your throne, that you have all power, and that in the end, your will will be done. And we praise you for that kind of power, and we praise you that you, you look upon us as frail as we are with love and affection, and you want the best for us. So, God, we thank you for that. Open our eyes now to hear your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Ben, you forgot to bring the trash can up again. Oh, sorry. I was just I don't see why it's so hard for you to remember. You have to bring it up every single Tuesday. What, did you walk right past it? Come on, you don't even have that many... What is this? I was just uh, drawing something. Well, clean it up. I will. No, don't just say you're going to clean it up. Do it. Just, let me just finish. Let me just get it. Wait, that's my car. You can draw when you're finished with your chores. Right now, it's not time to play. It's time to work. Do what I asked you to do first. Oh, come on. Listen. There's no need to cry. Right? There's just a right way to do things. And do you want to do things your way, or do you want to do things the right way? The right way, I guess. All right. I'll get this cleaned up. Now. Hey, are you all done? What's wrong? Did he show you the comic book he was making you for your birthday? I think it was supposed to be a surprise. Well, he knows he's supposed to do his chores first. work to do right now, bud. I uh, just really don't have time to play chess, okay? It will only take five minutes. Come on. <laughs> I know chess. A good game can go on for hours. No, no, it's not chess. I completely, I completely made up my own rules. Come on. Uh, why would you want to make up your own rules? I mean, chess is a great game. Look, uh, the instructions are right here. Just, just look at that. Get you there. No, but Dad, I'm, I made up the entire game from scratch. Just let me show you how to play, okay? Look, chess has been around for a thousand years, okay? Now there's a strategy and order. Changing the rules defeats the whole purpose of the game. Look, I'm gonna show you how to play really quickly, but then I have to work, okay? All right, first of all, I don't need Wait, these. What, are you, what are you doing with those? No, don't throw them away! It's just a bunch of paper, bud. You need to learn how to play the real game. Oh, and those? Are you kidding me? Uh, uh, let's see, yeah, these aren't set up right. And I worked on those! And uh, that was so hard! Look, this is a rook, okay? It moves forward or backward, but never diagonal. Are you listening? Uh, this, this isn't, this isn't very fun. Well, we haven't even started yet. I know, it's just that regular chess, it, it, it's so boring and well, I liked my way better, okay? Well, you can't just make up your own rules. I mean, there's just a right way to do things in a right order. Now, do you want to do things your way or Right way. The right way, I guess. You know, my way is going to be right way. All right, now this is called a night. Okay, now with the... Grab your stuff. We don't want to be late. What? You're leaving already? Yeah, we've got, I've got to go to summer camp. We've got an hour's drive ahead of us. <sighs> How many times did you do to play his game? Isn't it so much fun? He's been working all day on it. OK, say goodbye. Bye, bud.
This is the second uh, message in our Seek Wisdom series, and today we're talking about seeking wisdom in our words, and words matter, don't they? Nowhere do I think words matter more than in texting. Y'all ever had a text fail? All right, don't look these up. I'm just going to tell you right now, don't look these up because some of them are way inappropriate, so it took me a while to find some good ones that I could share in church, but here's some. Here's the first one. Um, Cindy, make it to the hotel, okay, sweetie? Now, I want you to notice up there at the top, the, the greater than sign or the less than sign in the three. I didn't know this because I'm too old, but I had to look it up. That's, that's for heart. That means love. I love you. That's important because you're going to see this here in a second. Make it to the hotel, okay, sweetie? Yes, I'm having so much fun. Wish you were her. What? Broken heart. Broken heart, right? See the, see the, the backslash? Here, 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 baby, I miss you. I wish you were here. I, I love you so much, and I would never cheat on you. This is my favorite part. Oh, well, your car got keyed, and the tires got slashed by the neighbor kid. They also pushed your TV and computer out of the bedroom window and poured bleach on your clothes. I love you too. Would you say that's a fail? That's a fail, right? Next one. Mom with a heart emoji. Hi, Bridget. I space, space, space. How space, our space, you space, doing period, capital, I love this new phone, exclamation point. I see you're using voice text. You don't have to say space, mom. It does it for you. I cucumber letter P Ritalin. Mom, stop. Just type. I'm telling you, you better, you better at least have it, because I use, I use voice to text all the time, and you need to have, when you're driving, right, so you don't have to, and you need to have, him, have Siri read it, or whatever your phone is, read it back to you, because I have almost sent some stuff that people in this church would have used against me, I mean, you know, in, in a good, bad way. They'd be going, do you, do you know what Doug said? And they'd be putting it up here on the screen, so you got to be careful. Uh, baby, hey, I love you. I love you too, babe. No, seriously, I can't stop thinking about you. My heart starts hurting when you're not with me. I can't stop listening to stupid love songs that remind me of you. And I just miss you so much. I love this. Fine, I get it. You want a sandwich. And he says, love you, babe. Right? That one was actually, that, that one kind of worked for him. But, you know, all right. Now, last Sunday... I get here, you know, usually around 7, 7.15 on a Sunday morning. I get ready for the band, and I'm running around. And, and you're going to understand more about my personality as we go through this talk and if you do our, our small group study. But my, I get, I'm very task-oriented, on, especially on Sunday mornings. The most important thing I do for my job is right here what I'm doing right now every Sunday. And so I take that very seriously. spend a lot of hours writing out my sermon, studying my sermon, putting th- stuff on the screen for my sermon. And so... If you happen to interrupt my thought process on a Sunday morning, then you do. I mean, you're people, you do. And I'm distracted. It's because I'm task-oriented, right? So, okay. So last Sunday morning, it's about 7.18. I went back and checked this out. I, at 7.18, I'm running around, and I get this text. And here it is. This is from Jenny Halleck. Jenny says, is Lakeview today? Now, Jenny's personality is very, very different from mine. If you know Jenny, you'll understand this. Jenny, Jenny doesn't, doesn't understand dates very well, and, and you know she's just very spur of the moment. So she said, is today? Lakeview. And I said, it's September 29th. So she says, what is today? Very logically, I'm like, September 8th. She was so upset with me that I didn't understand. So later in the text, she says, is there anything special going on today? I'm like, church. And then small group kickoff is tonight. She goes, yay. So she comes to small group last Sunday night. And she's like, how could you not understand what I was saying? I said, I understood perfectly what you were saying. You just asked me, what is the date of of the Lakeview trip, September 29th? What is today? I just assumed Jenny didn't know what the day was. And so I told her what the day was. And she's like, no, I wanted to know. And she was so, her face, and her husband standing right there next to her, he goes, I would have answered the same way. And I'm like, high five. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, we we misunderstand each other all the time in, in text, right? But it's not just texting. Ever had a conversation fail? We do it all the time. Thank you, Michael, for playing along. All of us have those. You said one thing, or I said one thing, you heard another. You said one thing, and I heard another. Something totally different happens all the time. But I'm guessing, I'm guessing if I were to ask you to grade yourself on your communication skills, you would probably grade yourself higher than other people in your life. And let me tell you why I believe that. It's because psychologists have come up with something that they call the self-serving bias. Did I put that up there? Self-serving bias. Let me explain. Humans have this almost limitless capacity for self-deception. We tend to make ourselves the heroes of the story, 
right? You don't believe me? Have you ever exaggerated how mad you were in a conversation or the words you used in a conversation or how good you did? Have you ever exaggerated or am I the only one? You ever, when you're telling the story, you look like the hero and the other person looks like the person to blame? I'm the only one? Okay, there's a few of us. Well, Here's, here, we tend to exaggerate our victories and blame other people for our failures, and we tend to make ourselves the heroes of our stories. We even believe that a movie should be made about our lives, and let me tell you, nobody's coming to your movie. Nobody's coming to my movie, but let me explain this. So 800,000, all right, 800,000 high school students were polled, and they were asked if they were above average in social skills. Now, I know we got a couple of math teachers in here today. Now, just based on the odds, if, if if, if they were truthful, half of the uh, 800,000 should be above average and half would be below average. Doesn't that just make sense, right? Okay, so the high schoolers were asked, are you above average, below average in your social skills? Guess how many of them said they were below average? Come on, just guess. Put it up there. Zero. None of the 800,000 said, I'm below average. Nobody wants to admit that they're below average, right? Right? Now, that's not all. 25%, okay, let's do this math. 25% of 800,000 is what? 200,000. Some of you are like, what? 200,000, all right? 200,000 of these high school students said they were in the top 1%. Now, do the math. 1% of 800,000 is 8,000. 200,000 said, oh, yeah, I'm part of the 8,000. That's how we are as human beings. You, it doesn't make sense. It's impossible. Did you know the majority of people in hospitals, this was another survey, in hospitals because of car crashes they themselves caused rated themselves above average drivers? What? Well, I was reading this and the, and the author says, is there any place where this self-serving bias doesn't show up? And then he says, surely higher education. So college professors, 88% of college professors rated themselves above average and in irony above all ironies. 25% of those college professors says, we're exceptional. We're in the top 1%. What is wrong with us? There's not a single place this doesn't show up, this self-serving bias. National Survey found that we feel nine years younger than we look, than we actually are. It's a, sorry, we feel nine years younger than we actually are. So I'm 55, I feel 46. And we claim that we look five years younger than other people our age. Brad, sorry, dude. I feel like I'm five years younger than you. Brad's my age. John, next service. Surely we don't find this in churches, do we? 90% of pastors think we're above average preachers. What is wrong with us? And I, I think if you lined up 100 pastors, I think I would at least be, you know, in the top 51. I'm not ever going to say I'm in the top 1%. No. No. But I think I, you know, right? What's wrong with us? Well, Jeremiah tells us in Jeremiah 29, 17, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately what? Wicked. We deceive ourselves because it's in us. This sinful nature is in us. Who really knows how bad it is? Jesus said it this way in Matthew 12, 34a. For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. Those words that come out, they started in your heart. Proverbs 18, 21 says, the tongue can bring death or life. I've been using this verse a lot lately in my life and, and with other groups. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. So our tongue has the power to speak life or to speak death. We talked about this back in June. And not only can the tongue bring life or death, I think the thumbs in texting can speak life or death. So if texting is one of the best ways to miscommunicate, what does that say about communication in general? Because another survey said 90% of all problems in the workplace are due to miscommunication. Same survey said 90% of marriage problems are due to miscommunication. Evidently, communicating is the best way to miscommunicate. So we need to do something about that. Well, the Bible has something to tell us about that, and it's in Ephesians 4.29. This is going to be the theme verse for our study, um, our small group study, but it's also the theme verse for today, and here's what it says. Do not let, now we're going to come back to that word in just a second, do not let any unwholesome talk. Unwholesome talk would be talk that tears other people down. You ever done that? You ever talked in a way that tore somebody down? Have you ever been talked about in a way that tore you down? Unwholesome talk means anything that tears them down. So instead, we need to do wholesome talk, which builds them up with our words. 
Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only, only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs. Usually in communication, whose needs is the speaker articulating? Their own. He says, no, we need to be cognizant of other people's needs. Usually it's, here's what I want, here's what you're doing wrong. Paul says, eh, wrong answer. The focus of biblical communication is, not the, is the hearer, not the speaker according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen, as opposed to benefiting the speaker. We've been doing it wrong all along. We're speaking our needs instead of speaking according to those who listen. So how's that working out for you? If we did a poll right now, and I were to ask you, are you above average in communication? I bet every one of you go, yeah. Is your marriage above average? Most of us are going to say yes. Is your, is your relationship with your children above average? Paul says, no, it's not because your communication is focused the wrong place. He says, if you want to improve your communication and honor God, then he says a couple of things. Number one, communicate based on the listener's needs, their needs. And then I love this. He says, customize your words based on who is listening. Oh, my goodness. If I do this, my communication improves. So starting tonight, we're going to spend six weeks looking at this verse and, and temperaments, but I want to give you kind of a quick overview to kind of pique your curiosity and maybe get you involved in small groups or at least in this study. So we're going to be talking about temperaments, and there are four temperaments, and, and so I'm not as worried about you remembering the name as I am the color, but some of you, you'll, you're, you're going to want to know the name, and so I'll tell you that in just a second. So let's look at this. The first one is sanguine. So those of you who are, who are in, the, in the blue category, you're going to want to know the names. The rest of us don't care about these names, but the blue category, you care about the names. So the, the first one, yellow, is sanguine. Now, I prefer... To, to have some animals, right? So I remember it this way. So the yellow is otter. Love people and fun. Do you know people that all they want to do is, is hang out with a bunch of people. They draw energy from people and they just want to have fun. That's the otter. That's the yellow. That's the sanguine. Um, the red is power and control. These are the, these are the A type personalities. Um, and I, I prefer to use the, the, the animal lion, because what does the lion do? He roars. He's the king of the jungle. When he's under stress, he, he roars. Power and control. The third one, the green one down here, the actual term is um, uh, phlegmatic. See why I don't like these? Sanguine, uh, choleric, phlegmatic, and melancholic. I just don't even like those terms. But, but you blue people, you like them, so I'm telling you. I'm telling the blue people. Okay, so green is calm and harmony. This is, this is what I call the golden retriever. Because you think about the golden retriever, they just harmony, just love everybody, just want everybody to get along. And then the blue is perfection in order. That's a beaver. Now, when I took the personality profile years ago, I'm a lion first and I'm an otter second. So I am a lion otter. <laughs> lion otter didn't sound as good as lion otter. So I'm a lion otter. So I'm, I'm power and control. I love people, love fun. I married a golden beaver retriever. Janie is green and blue. You marry the opposite. It is God's sense of humor. Because what was so cute when you were dating? 24-7. You have to learn to appreciate this. Now, I'm not talking about habits here. Habits can be changed. I'm talking about your temperament. And here's what Kathleen Edelman, the person who wrote, um, I said this, you heard that. Here's what she says about your temperament. Temperament is your innate wiring from God, what you're naturally predisposed to, like your eye color or fingerprint. It's unchangeable. It's why some people are drawn to the spotlight and stage, and others are content with a cubicle in a quiet office. You don't choose who you are, and you can't change how you're wired, though many of us try. So, the yellow and red, go back to that first slide. Don't do the next one yet. Go ahead and put that first one. Okay, yellow and red. So, otters and lions are extroverts. They draw energy from people. The more the merrier, the bigger the crowd, the more energetic they are. And they're very verbal. They talk a lot. And they actually process what they're thinking and what they believe while speaking. I see you over there, Cassandra. Janie will say to me sometimes, why don't you call Chris or why don't you call Cameron, two of my best friends who are also pastors. If I'm struggling through something, she'll say, why don't you talk it out with one of these guys that you love and respect? 
because she understands my temperament, my personality. Um, as they're talking and thinking, they really work that stuff out. Now, the green and blue are introverts. introverts. So we got the golden retriever and the beaver. They are introverts. They don't speak a lot. They think a lot before they speak, all right? Red and blue. Now, look at red and blue. The, the lions and the beavers are very task-oriented. The task is more important than your feelings. Suck it up, buttercup. Let's get the job done. I can't tell you how many people I've offended through the years because I get so focused on the task and it's part of who I am. Now, I, I can be nicer as long as we get the job done, right? And then if you look at the otters and the golden retrievers, they're very people oriented and they are always going to take the side of people. So I can't tell you how many times in 28 years, Janie will rise up and, and you know, this, this calm, let everybody get along. And she said to me, she, a couple of times, actually, she has shook her finger in my face and said, you just hurt her feelings or one of the kids or whatever. And, and so you would think that a power, that a lion would roar back. No, dude, it was the sexiest thing. I wanted to kiss her. Um, but it was highly inappropriate at that moment to kiss her uh, because I had offended her. I mean, you got to go a long ways to offend a, a, a golden beaver retriever, right? So, so you got to remember these things. All right. Ephesians 4.29 says this, build others a, up according to whose needs? Their needs. There you go. According to their needs. Is that what you're known for? Are you above average in using your words to help others? You're not about to answer any of my poll questions after how I started this sermon, are you? Are you an expert at building others up with your words? If so, if you're in the top 1% of building people up with your words, you don't need what this study has to offer. But if not, if you're just above average or if you're below average with your words, then you need what we're going to do over these next six weeks. If you've ever made a mess of relationships through your words, is it wise not to be a part of a small group? And I know somebody's going to say, I can't come on Sunday nights. Guess what? You don't have to. All of, these, all of the, the studies are on YouTube. You can watch them for free or you can get an app where you can watch them for free. If you get our book back here, the books, if you buy them through us, they're $15. If you just go to the website, it's $21. We got a, a discount because we ordered so many. You can start your own group or you can do it on your own. If you want to be better with your words at building people up, don't skip this. Now, let me tell you just a couple more things. We'll finish up today. Your temperament determines a couple of things. Number one, the words you speak. Okay, so go ahead and put that next thing up there if you would, Krista. All right, so here's, the, here's what these different people speak, these different temperaments. Over here, remember the otter, the, uh, the sanguine? Um, he speaks, that sounds fun. You know some people that no matter what it is, that sounds fun, okay? Then over here, you got the, you got the reds, you got the lions. Hurry up and do what I said. Let's get the job done. The, the yellow... Let's just have more people. The red, it's great to have people as long as they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Down here to the green, the, the, the golden retrievers, whatever. I'm flexible. Ask a golden retriever where they want to eat. You will never get anywhere, ever, right? Just, we were going to the Rangers game on Friday. Janie and I are driving, and I said, where do you want to eat? And I was starving. She goes, wherever, whatever you want. And she means it. She actually means it. She said, and she said her words to me were, you choose what sounds good to you because I can eat anywhere. Whatever, I'm flexible. Oh, and the, and the blue, this is the beavers, all right? Is it safe? Do they follow the rules at that restaurant? Okay, now, let's say that four of you are in the back today. Let's say you go out in the living room and four of you, the four different temperaments, you're trying to decide which restaurant to go to, and it might look something like this. We could name a 100 restaurants in Palestine, and you're probably going to get something like these statements up here on the screen. So, four of you says, where should we eat? The green person says, whatever, I don't care. The golden retriever. The red power control person says, and I'm just using this for, I, this is my story. I get to choose. Just do what I say. Chili's, good food, fast, decent price. The yellow, the otter says, that sounds fun. And then the yellow proceeds to invite everybody who's still on the property. They go to all of their contacts in their phone. Chili's, party at Chili's, come on. To which the red goes, there's no way we can get all those people in there in a, in a decent amount of time and get home and take a nap and be back here for small groups tonight. You uninvite them right now. 
And the blue person goes, I've seen the seating capacity at Chili's, and we're going to exceed that. Is it safe to take that many people there? And I heard that their lettuce has E. coli. And the red person goes, you idiot. That was Chipotle. That was several years ago. To which the yellow goes, Mexican, that sounds fun. And all of the time, the green's going, whatever. I'm flexible. Do you see how this works? And do you see how it contributes to miscommunication? So your temperament determines the words that come out of your mouth. Second thing, your temperament determines the words you need to hear. And this is even bigger, in my opinion. All right, put that next slide up there if you would. So the otter, the yellow, the sanguine, needs approval, needs acceptance, needs attention, needs affection. Because they are a people person. They're a people pleaser. It doesn't mean they're a bad person. We're not talking about bad. We're talking about this is how God wired them. So you may have children. Your children have different temperaments. It's part of why they don't get along. And, and the, the otter needs energy, d- derives energy from people and the words those people say. So if you have a yellow, an otter in your workforce, then, then this is what they need to hear from you in order for them to be the maximum person that God designed them to be. Go over here to the red. The lions, loyalty, sense of control, appreciation, credit for work. Um, we, were at a, we were at a youth deal years ago, and I, may, I think I've already told this story. Um, so you understand I'm a, I'm a Leon otter, so I get into stories. I love telling stories, right? So anyway, we were at this, this youth thing, and, and just by the luck of the draw, we were put in these different small groups. Well, this, this lady was in charge of the small group, and, and she, she, was, she was one of these... Um, Golden Retrievers wants to be in a cubicle by herself somewhere, and just she was the leader of this small group of people she didn't even know. And so she was very quiet. She was very timid. And kids in my youth group were going, Doug, would you please lead this? I mean, they're whispering to me, Doug, start leading, start leading. Just take over, take over. And I'm like, I can't do that. So after the session, I went up to her and I said, hey, how can I help you? And she hands me the Bible study and says, lead it. And I said, okay. And so I did. Right? She was in a position that didn't, didn't make her feel accepted and certainly didn't make her feel valuable. She was willing to hand that off in a heartbeat. So the lions want to be in charge, and the lions will follow somebody in charge as long as they're going in a, in a direction and as long as they know what they're doing. But then the lions are going to have trouble if they don't do that. Okay, you get down here to the, uh, to the green, to the uh, golden retriever. Harmony, worthiness, lack of stress, um, and, and respect. They're people pleasers. Now, the blue, the, the, the uh, beavers, safety, sensitivity, support, space, and silence. They need a cubicle by themselves sometimes. When, uh, when we first came here and I was a youth minister, we would have parties at our house and, and got a little bit of an idea of Rachel's um, temperament when she was just barely old enough to even walk. So when, when the youth group used to come to our, our house, Caleb, my oldest, when somebody would ring the doorbell, he assumed they were there for him. He, he's, he's got an otter and lion in him. And so he would run to the doorbell, come on in. He would grab them by, it didn't matter who it was. Come on in, take them back to his room and start playing with them. Start telling them stories, just having the best time. Rachel, when she was little, if the doorbell rang, she ran and found mama and was trying to hide. And one night we had the teenagers there. Caleb's playing. He's just having his great time. He thinks everybody's there for him. Rachel starts shaking, just freaking out shaking. She's a little baby. And Janie had to go and take her in our room. And she sat there in the dark just holding Rachel, saying, baby, it's okay. It's okay. Just talking soothingly to her. And you understand the temperament shows up very, very early. Now, here's, here's what I want you to understand about all of this. Number three, every word you use is a word you choose. You understand what I'm saying? Every word you use, you have chosen that word. So let's figure out how we can put this into practice. And I'll talk more about that in just a second. Three easy things or simple things. They may not always be easy. First is pause before you speak. Think before you speak. So if you want to put this into practice tomorrow morning when you get, or even when you leave here today, think before you speak. Second, Offer grace. We're all wired differently, and and just because we're in church and because we believe Psalm 139, which said, you knit me together in my mother's womb, David was talking to whom when he said those words? God. Who created us? If the temperament is hardwired, then who wired us? Y'all weren't so sure. 
If the temperament's hardwired into you, who wired you? God did. So when I criticize you, I'm actually criticizing God who wired you that way. And grace says you don't have to be like me. In fact, can you imagine if you married someone just like you? One of you is going to jail. Right? Praise God we're all not alike. And we marry the opposite. And, and one of my favorite books in my library says opposites attract, and then that's marked out, and then underneath it's put attack. Right? Because what was so cute all of a sudden is not so cute if we only focus on our differences. So that gives me the third one. Celebrate the differences between you and the other people, whether it's your spouse or whether it's people you work with. Celebrate those differences because here's, here's what I've learned in marriage counseling through the years. People who like each other don't get a divorce. People who can't stand each other divorce all the time. And so you need to celebrate those things. So if I focus on the things about Janie that drive me crazy, I'm going to get angry. There's a whole lot more about me that could drive her crazy, right? So like one of the things is I stack stuff. It's not like, it's not like food and things like that. I stack books everywhere. There are stacks everywhere. And, and every few weeks or months, I come home and there's some new organizing thing that she has, she has gotten and, and she organizes my stuff and she's being so helpful, aren't you, baby? In her mind, she's like, yes, and, and I'm, I'm just, I don't care about that. Now, it is helpful, right? But, but a lot of times, believe it or not, I know where in that stack my stuff is. And when you move it, I don't. <laughs> Celebrate the differences. Let's go back to Ephesians 4.29. What's the third word? Do not let. Do not what? You have a choice. Don't let unwholesome talk, which tears people down, come out of your mouths, but only the Scripture, God's Word says only. How many times today have you violated the Scripture? Let only what is helpful for building others up, not for getting your point across, not for scolding someone. And I'm not saying we don't discipline. There's even a way to do that. I'm studying Ecclesiastes and Solomon and what he keeps saying over it. There's a time for peace. There's a time for war. There's a time for life. There's a time for death. There's a time for everything under the sun. What I'm saying is we don't spend near enough time focusing on the listeners. We spend all of our time trying to get our point across, and that's why our communication is so poor. Only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit the person who listens to you. You have a choice. But you already knew that, didn't you? Because everybody in here is above average when it comes to communicating. In fact, we just might be in the top 1%. Every one of us in this room might just be in the top 1%. You're so good at communication, you should be leading the small group starting tonight. Right? No? Maybe not? All right. Wise words according to Scripture are like gold and silver. They're like refreshing water, like, like when you've been out working and your, your soul, you're, you're, you're just parched and you take that first drink of water and it's cool going down. Wise words are like that. So let me read you just a couple of Scriptures and we're done. Proverbs 15, 4 says, Gentle words, gentle words are a tree of life. The first time we see the tree of life is in the Garden of Eden. And after Adam and Eve sinned, God closed the Garden of Eden. We can't get back there. And now when you read about the tree of life, it's in heaven. And when you eat from the fruit of the tree of life, it restores your life. When you're in heaven, it restores your life over and over. And, and the, it bears fruit every month in heaven. So when this says gentle words are like a tree of life, it means you are about the process with your words of restoring that person to paradise. Not pointing out their faults, not tearing them down, building them back like God originally intended. Now, we're not ever going to get there because this is a sinful world. But my words need to build up, not tear down. Gentle words are a tree of life, but a deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. Proverbs 12, 18, the words of the reckless pierce like swords. You ever been pierced by someone's words? But the tongue of the wise brings healing. And then look what the Bible says about God's words in Proverbs 4, 22. God's words bring life 
to those who find them and healing to their whole body. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the thumbs. We're going to spend the next six weeks trying to speak life. And so my question to you is, is it wise for you not to participate in that? How I'm praying that you'll choose life, whether you come on Sunday nights or whether you just get involved, you know, watching YouTube and, you, you know, you get a friend or two to your house. Let's choose life with our words. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you that Jesus gave us a perfect example of how to speak life. There were times when he says, you hypocrite, and that needed to be said. But there were other times when he said, where are your accusers? Does no one condemn you? And he says, neither do I condemn you. Teach us to be wise with our words. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.